for inviting me here. It's so nice to be back. Um, I was here six years ago, and I really like uh, running around the hills and going down to the beach to take a swim. It's very fun. Of course, the talks have also been fantastic, so I'm really enjoying this. Um, all right, so I want to tell you about something um, that I've been doing recently. Uh, it's studying the evolu evolution of cooperative behaviors in a particular kind of game, an iterated survival game, which I'll describe in lots of detail as we go. I want to point out that this is joint work with Martin Novak, who's my colleague at Harvard University. All right, so I'm not going to give a big introduction to the paradox of the evolution of cooperation, but the basic idea is that we can all imagine that if all of us were to cooperate together, then all of us together would be better off than if we did not cooperate. And the various models that look into the evolution of that kind of behavior pose certain dilemmas for the evolution of cooperation, essentially that cheating or not helping out um, it seems favorable under many circumstances. So here are some of the ideas or motivations behind this talk. Um, there's this wonderful book by Kropotkin from 1902, um, which captures a lot of what I would like to say in, in very nice language um, from way back then. Um, and the idea is that cooperative behaviors might enhance survival. So the model that I'll describe, that will not be the only possibility, but it's one that we're really interested in. A uh, point that I like to make is survival in evolutionary evolution is a very natural measure of the payoff of any sort of behavior or type in a population. Sometimes in, in game theory, there's a distinction between the payoff, which is in some units, and the utility, which is in a way of rescaling payoffs, uh, depending on how much they matter. For example, if I get a raise of a certain amount of money, it makes a bigger difference to me if I don't make very much money right now than if I make a whole lot of money. So survival or fitness, uh, viability in this context is a natural measure of payoff. And I'm gonna make a lot in this talk about uh, the structure that you are familiar with already from knowing about diploid viability selection. So here the players are going to be haploid players and they'll be interacting in pairs just like two alleles uh, in a single individual interact, but it'll be a little bit uh, more complicated than that. And so here's a picture uh, which captures a lot of what I'm saying, you know, two of us can really get something done if we work together, and uh, not so much if we're working alone. This cover, I think, is from the early 1970s. It's a very uh, idyllic looking picture. The model that I'm going to describe would be a little more like putting a big weight, you know, maybe 100 kilogram, 200 kilogram weight on these people, and then it's not so much fun anymore, not so idyllic. It's more of a harsh uh, survival game. And that's what this book is about. Here's a quote from it. Uh, Kropotkin wrote, uh, you know, two aspects of animal life impressed me most during the journeys which I made in my youth to eastern Siberia and northern Manchuria. One of them was the extreme severity of the struggle for existence which most species of animals have to carry on against an inclement nature. So nature is inclement in this world as it is, for example, in the winter in these places. The other was that uh, even in those few spots where animal life teemed in abundance, I failed to find, although I was eagerly looking for it, that bitter struggle for the means of existence among which animals belonging to the same species, uh, which was considered by most Darwinists to be the dominant characteristic of the struggle for life. On the other hand, what Kropotkin saw, whenever he saw animals living in abundance, he saw mutual aid and mutual support as what explained the ability to survive in these kinds of habitat. And so he suspected that this feature, rather than competition, was of the utmost importance in evolution. And of course, Kropotkin didn't know a lot of things. Uh, you know, he didn't know about genetics. He didn't know about relatedness. He didn't have anything, there's nothing in this book at all about the idea that there might be a conflict of interest between individuals, that I might cheat, I might gain some advantage among uh, a group that I'm in by cheating somehow. He didn't think about that. So he just distributed, uh, attributed the fact that animals live together as evidence that mutual aid is the factor which explains it. 
here's a preview of the game that I'm going to look at in much detail in this talk. And uh, the idea is that two individuals are confronted with an unavoidable task, which we will model as this iterated survival game. The game always has n iterations, and surviving to the end of the game is the only payoff. A key feature of this game, super important in all of what I will present, is that if your partner dies, you have to keep going in the game. So here's the idea. Etienne and I are asked by the rest of you to make this trip across northern Manchuria in the winter together at night. And at night, we have only one blanket, right? So we're sharing a blanket. And uh, you know we get together, get warm, share the blanket. But you know, I don't know. I don't know which of us is the less cooperative. Let's say it's me. Um, so I, you know, each night I steal the blanket a little more. <laughs> And uh, poor Etienne is out there in the cold. And then one of the nights, you, you all have sent us out for, say, 100 nights. On night 45, I steal the blanket entirely. And unfortunately, you pass away. <laughs> he goes cold. Um, and so I feel, OK, the, that night I'm OK. I made it. But then the next <laughs> night, I have the blanket. But that's all I've got. And I might have changed my situation for the worse, much worse here, because I no longer have your warmth, right? Um, and that's sort of an extreme, ex one of the examples of what can happen in this kind of model, the one that I'll be particularly focusing on in this talk. Um, the basic overall question is, uh, one specific question is, uh, under what circumstances, like the one I described, um, you can imagine that cooperation would evolve in that sort of situation. But what are the criteria for that sort of thing? All right, so I'm going to give a, a certain amount of background to the kinds of games that I will be looking at. And here's a, an introduction to the prisoner's dilemma. This is one of the classic dilemmas for the evolution of cooperation. Here are two books, uh, really interesting books, uh, one by Axelrod, which is uh, describing some computer simulations of a big competition experiment among different programs that he solicited uh, to play this, this exact prisoner's dilemma with these payoffs in this matrix right here. Uh, the basic idea is that there are two individuals. One, um, we just designate them for the moment as partner and individual. And what's in the matrix are the payoffs to the individual with the given partner. There are two types. Let's call A cooperate, the cooperative type, and B the defector or non-cooperative type. And I'll always use that notation throughout the talk. A is cooperation, B is non-cooperation or defection in the prisoner's dilemma. So if I'm a cooperator and my partner is a cooperator, I get a three payoff. If I'm a cooperator and my partner is a defector, I get zero payoff. And you can see the structure of this matrix is such that uh, no matter what my partner is, um, it's better for me. I get a higher payoff if I were to defect or be of the defective ty uh, defector type. So if I'm thinking about it, let's say I'm a rational actor like I am, um, I look at that and I say, oh boy, OK, if we're playing this game a number of times, what I should do each time is defect. I should just be the defector, because no matter what you do, it's better for me to defect. And so I do that, and my partner does that, and we both get payoffs according to this matrix. And here's what would happen. Uh, we would go defect, 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 defect the entire way across. We're rational, completely rational. And so at the end, we would have 10 points. And that might be, seem good. But then if you stare at the matrix for a moment, you can see that, obviously, if we had both cooperated the entire time, we would end up with 30. And that's much better, right? But that's hard to get to somehow with this structure of the game. For example, if I defect and you cooperate, you get 0, 0, 0 all the way across, and I get 5 all the way across. And, and that would be very bad for you. You don't want to do that. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting book, this one by Rappaport and Chama. It's an experimental psychology book where uh, students at the University of Michigan were asked to play this kind of game repeatedly. It's, it's super interesting. I would, If you're at all uh, intrigued by this kind of model, I suggest you read that book. Um, humans do not do this, even if they're staring right at the matrix. All right, a little more introduction to a slightly generaler version of that. Um, I'm going to be using these notations also throughout the talk. 
instead of num numbers for payoffs, often I'm gonna have these symbols, A, B, C, and D, which are the payoffs um, to in the individual of each type with a partner of each type. And um, so one thing to say, I already said for the prisoner's dilemma, but just to be clear, this is a symmetric two-player game. So each individual is considered first the individual and then the partner. So we trade off always from this matrix, both getting payoffs according to the matrix. Oops. All right, a little more about that and a little more notation. So I'm always going to assume, like I said, that A, capital A, is the cooperative type, and B is the less cooperative type. So that means that I'm assuming in this matrix that little a is bigger than little d. I will always assume that. That's okay. If it were the other way around, I would just relabel the types, a and b, and switch the labels. Uh, so there's no loss of generality to do that. And if you recall the way I was doing this with the prisoner's dilemma, I just look at what I, what my choices are depending on what my partner's type is, and that comparison is what tells me whether cooperation is favored given each kind of partner. So A minus C gives the advantage or is a measure of the advantage of A compared to B when the partner is A. And B minus D is the advantage, a measure of it, um, of cooperation compared to non-cooperation when the partner is a non-cooperator. So I can just stare at the matrix and do these comparisons and get some intuition about whether cooperation is a, a favorable sort of strategy to take or a favorable type to be in a population. These kinds of uh, co cooperative dilemmas, barring the um, the case that these payoffs could be equal to each other uh, can be easily divided into uh, four cases. And here's a little bit of um, help I will give you for the rest of the talk. Once in a while, or often, you'll see a matrix up there just to remind you of what's going on. I find this very helpful because when I'm thinking about these games, my brain just completely turns off. It's not my normal way of thinking about things, uh, so it is helpful for me to have that up there. So remember, A, big A is cooperative type, and big B is the non-cooperative type, and these are the payoffs for this individual with that kind of partner. All right, so the prisoner's dilemma we just saw, um, A minus C is negative and B minus D is negative when I make those comparisons, right? The other four, three kinds of games are, um, uh, you know, they're canonical versions of the other three kinds of games, but they, the way they're def defined is whether each of these is positive or negative, right? So the, a game which I'll call the stag hunt game. Stag hunt comes from the idea that there are two types. A, the cooperator who will always go for the big game. And if there are two cooperators, they'll get the big game. That's a big payoff. But one A cannot do it by itself. Um, B, on the other hand, the non-cooperator in the circumstance always goes for the little game, the hair, and is able to get the hair uh, without the help of anybody. So if my partner is going to be A, then it makes sense for me to be A and go for the big game, right? But if my partner is B, then I'm much better off being a type B also and going for the little game, not wasting my time trying to get the big game when I will know I will fail at it. All right, a third case is the so-called hawk-dove game. Now, hawks and doves don't refer to actual animals, but these are stereotypical uh, personality types. Um, a hawk is the less cooperative type, B, and the dove is the more cooperative type A. A dove, and this hawk-dove game describes uh, the, when two individuals are seeking a common resource. And if two doves show up at the, at the resource together, they're very friendly, they're, they're meek, they just split the resource and go on their way, right? If a hawk comes up, a hawk is always ready to fight for the resource, and a dove will never fight. So if a hawk, uh, if, if my partner is a dove, then it's better for me to be a hawk because I can just get the whole resource from the dove, no problem, that's very easy. However, if my partner is another hawk, the cost of the fight that we're going to get in is too great. It's much greater in this kind of game than the value of the resource. So I'm better in that situation being a dove 
going away from this fight, this particular one, I don't get any of the resource, but I'm not also not injured. So it's better for me to be um, a, a dove when my partner is a hawk. A final kind of game uh, is called the Harmony Game in this paper by De Jaeger and Hoyer in 2016, which I will come back to a number of times in this talk. And here it is, uh, both of these things are positive. A is bigger than C and B is bigger than D. So it always makes sense in the opposite way from the prisoner's dilemma, it always makes sense in the so-called harmony game to be a cooperator. And heads up, you know, later these, I will have P, D, S, H, H, D, and H, G in some of the graphs. And they refer to these particular games. They're ordered in the relative amount of co so-called cooperative dilemma. This is a paper by Martin. And, um, and the, you can look at the details of how cooperative dilemmas are defined in there. But you can see them also here. Here, cooperation is disfavored all the way across. Here it is favored um, when the partner is of type A. Here it's favored when the partner is of type B. Here it's favored all the way across. So you can think of them in this sort of order. What makes the um, static hunt dominate the whole dove game? It, the order, that's a good question. I don't think there's really necessarily in a sense to that. Those could be interchangeable. So one of them, the A type will be favored only if it is common enough in the population. That's the stag hunt. And in the hawk dove game, it's favored when it's rare, but not when it's common. Could it be just in the stag hunt game, you actually get fixation, this equilibrium associated with the cooperation strategy is stable? That, that's is a good a reason. reason. Yep. I need Martin here to explain the ordering of them, but that's a good, good answer. Um, in the stag hunt game, if I start above a certain uh, frequency of cooperation, which we'll see in just a second, um, I will go to fixation of that type. And in the hawk dove game, both types are maintained, so cooperation can invade, but it cannot go to fixation. Good question. All right, so in order to um, put those intuitions that we got from just looking at the matrix into one context, uh, one can uh, make an evolutionary model. And here are two that are based on the idea of an infinite sized population. So now the frequency of the cooperative type is going to be little x in this infinite population, just assuming that for the moment. In a, later in the talk, I'll t I will uh, cover finite populations. <clears throat> And it's possible in, a, in assuming a continuous time model to derive this equation here, uh, which is known as the replicator equation. And in a discrete time model, essentially a model like the models of diploid viability selection where there are non-overlapping generations, uh, one can derive this other equation, which you can see has the exact same form for the most part except that it is scaled by this thing W bar, which is the mean fitness of the population. And if you, oh, and I should say throughout this entire talk, there will be no mutation. So I'm, we're in this, in this work, we have considered no mutation, and we have considered A and B just to be fixed, pure strategies or types where there's no choice, there's no reactive thinking the way I've been describing it so far just for intuition's sake. Uh, they're just types um, and they, there's no mutation. So this entire uh, project is really about the effect of selection in relatively large populations given this new kind of survival game. All right, so I said this a little bit already. So A minus C, if you stare at this equation, um, if A is very common, then X is close to one, and this is the big term here. And so A minus C gives the direction of selection when, when A is very common, and B minus D gives the direction of selection when A is rare. Oh, I can use this, can't I? Um, here's a kind of a graphical depiction of these three, three of the four cases that I had up there before. One is the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, that's on in this column here, then the stag hunt, then the hawk dove game, and I'm not showing the harmony game, which is the, would be the fourth case. And what I've got in the upper graphs are an individual and its partner. Left is the individual, right is the partner. So it's individual B with partner B, individual A with partner B, and so on. 
and I've connected the lines, the, the points that have these two uh, payoffs that we've been comparing in the two columns of the payoff matrix up there and in the evolutionary dynamical equations on the previous slide. And you can see just visually from this that you know, when the slope of those little sticks is negative, both of them, then um, if you look down here and look at the results for that replicator equation on the previous slide, that the uh, predicted change in the frequency of the cooperator, cooperative type over the entire range of the frequency is going to be negative. So wherever I start, cooperation will be driven out of the population. It, in the stag hunt case, um, uh, like we were just talking about a minute ago, um, if I'm above a certain frequency, then I will go to fixation in the population, but it's impossible to get into that population. So it's a problem of how to get to that frequency, critical frequency or equilibrium above which I would go to fixation. Uh, the hawk dove game has both, of, uh, has that slope positive and that one negative. So the positive one affects this and the negative one here. And you can see that a, a cooperator could invade a population like that, just loosely speaking, um, but would never go to fixation, would just go to this fixed equilibrium point here, which in this case would be stable. Uh, here it would be unstable. Now to make the connection with diploid population genetics and viability selection, these things, same things come up. Um, they would be called uh, you know, directional selection for the prisoner's dilemma, but negative directional selection in this case, because the one we're focusing on is, is selected against. Um, Underdominance here and overdominance. The difference is with those kinds of models, these two points would be the same. The two uh, uh, alleles in a heterozygote, they always get the same fitness or viability in a diploid viability selection model. But in these games, they can have different fitnesses. That's the big tweak that happens. Um, and what it does allow is only this prisoner's dilemma case, which is kind of new. And it's new because A is bigger than D, so uh, that's uh, by assumption throughout, but somehow the type is disfavored across the entire allele frequency spectrum. This can't happen if you were to connect these two points. Right, if both of those slopes are negative and I connected those points, I would always have D bigger than A. So that's a unique thing that comes up with these game theoretic models that doesn't happen in diploid viability selection. All right, so the broader question uh, is how when we repeat this game, I keep saying the word iterated and I describe this, this many nights that we spent out sharing a blanket, um, how does the game change? Do these payoffs accumulate over iterations um, as the number of iterations gets bigger. So now I'm going to think, uh, focus on these quantities here, which will be the payoff at the end, or the total payoff of, of n iterations of a game um, in the same matrix. So here I start off with A, starting with A in the game. That's where we're both cooperators. And this is my, uh, it will be my probability of surviving uh, given that state over the whole probability of surviving all n iterations of the game. All right. And if the payoffs accumulate additively, like in that simple prisoner's dilemma at the very beginning where it was just one plus one plus one plus one plus one, then if I knew the difference between A and C, I know exactly the difference between A, N, and C, N. And the, signs of those things will never change. I will never move from one of those cooperative dilemmas to the other. But if something else happens, it has to, something else has to happen. And if it does, um, then I can get something uh, where the signs and the magnitudes of these things change as the number of iterations change. And there are a lot of times in evolutionary game theory, linearity is assumed of accumulation of payoffs, but other times it isn't. There are a certain number of papers that that have nonlinear uh, or other kinds of um, accumulations of payoffs. And here's an example that's probably the closest to, well, it's certainly the closest of any that I could find to what we have done. Um, and it, I, it's complicated, obviously, but let's just walk through it really quickly. Um, this is again from the paper I mentioned previously. And the idea here is that two individuals protect a public good. They're defending it. And they each have a private good, too at least their life, but it's something a little bit better than their life. Um, individual's private good uh, has a beneficial effect on the partner in this model. The words that are underlined 
correspond to parameters in this model in this paper. That's why they're underlined. Uh, and then this model also has public and private goods being weighted differently. All individuals share that parameter. Um, this one here. And the iterations in this model are a number of attacks. So we're defending the public good and we're getting attacked repeatedly by predators. There's a number of those attacks. That's the number of iterations. Individuals in this model have a half chance of being the one who is attacked in any given attack. So there are two of them and it's equally likely that either one is the one that is attacked. Um, defectors can sustain one attack at a cost to the public good, but more than one, they die. The public good is gone, their private good is gone. Uh, there's a fixed cost of being a cooperator in this model, but then cooperators enjoy this feature, which is really great. They are immune to attacks, completely immune to attacks. So the important point would be uh, the number of times defectors are attacked in this model as I, as I increase the number of attacks. And when you work out all the details of this, you can get nonlinear behavior of these payoffs that I had um, focused on, on the couple slides ago, you know, A, N, and C, N, B, and D, N, so, and, and here are these differences. So you can get a picture like this. It doesn't matter exactly what the parameters are, um, but you can set them so that you start off when there are zero attacks in a situation which is the prisoner's dilemma. Both of these differences are negative. And as the number of attacks increases, these two differences become uh, smaller and smaller, closer and closer to zero until eventually when there are four attacks for this particular set of parameters, it switches uh, from being a prisoner's dilemma game to being a stag hunt game. Now one of them has crossed zero and is positive and um, it's the one uh, where your you know, partner is a cooperator also and the other one is still slightly negative. But then when I go to five, six, seven, whatever, um, I end up with a game that is the so-called harmony game. Both of them are positive. Cooperative behaviors will evolve certainly um, in those simple deterministic models that I had up uh, previously. All right, so we studied this sort of thing in, uh, in our survival game. Yeah. A yeah, uh, question, so, so here uh, in this game, you never change your strategy, right? The, the two Same, yeah. yeah, you never change your strategy. Yeah, it's fixed. All right, so we studied this kind of behavior with the similar kind of question. You know, what happens as n gets bigger and bigger? Can we change these games that are very uh, negative in terms of the prospects for cooperation to ones that are more positive? Here's the game again. Um, that first part is just the description I had before. Um, here are the parameters which I already described and then there are going to be two more. So when there are two players, and there always will be two players uh, at the beginning of the game, um, then there will be a general payoff matrix with these same letters that I've been talking about so far. Um, these payoffs are going to be uh, probabilities of survival in each iteration. And so they're numbers between zero and one. And uh, when my partner dies, again, I have to be able to keep playing by myself. And so I have these new, two new probabilities, A naught and D naught, um, for my loner survival probabilities of the A type and the B type. Uh, and as I said before, A and B are dumb, dumb, dumb types. They just always cooperate or always defect. There's nothing smart about them. There's no reactive strategy, no conditional uh, strategy to them. They're just cooperate or not cooperate. Is there a difference between co cooperating and defecting when your partner's dead? There needn't be. So most of the numerical examples, uh, those two things will be the same, yeah. One of them it won't be, and I'll talk about that later, yeah. Um, okay, so there are various ways of think, depicting what happens here. Here's one that's a graphical depiction. Um, it's, a, it's a flow diagram of the stochastic process that happens in this game. There are six possible states. There are three pair states we've been talking about a lot. We always start in one of those states. Uh, there are two loner states, and then there is the state that both individuals have died. And uh, so for example, I might start in this state with an A and a B, 
And um, along the way, either the A could die or the B could die in one iteration, leaving a loner, or both of them could die in one iteration. And these are the arrows that depict what can happen in a single iteration in the game. So each of those arrows will have some prob probability associated with it. And, um, and those are on the next slide, collected into a big matrix. Um, so this is a matrix which describes the same thing, uh, but with the symbols that I've introduced, and so you can just stare at it. You know, if we start off with A and A, then the probability that both of them survive that iteration is just A squared. It's the payoff that both, each of them gets squared. And, you know, the, looking at another, you know, the probability that uh, B dies and A survives in one iteration, given that I start with A and B, is that, and so on. You can parse out uh, all of those. And then, finally, there are these, um, to loner survival probability. So I'm just, once I get into one of those states, I'm just waiting, uh, hoping that I don't die before the end of the game. And if I ever enter this state in the, in the game where both individuals have died, the whole thing's over, I just stay in that state until the end of all iterations. All right, so here's some very simple stuff that, um, that, that uh, I, I used and, um, and uh, to so solve that, for some of the probabilities that I'll be presenting. Um, anyway, it's basic stuff. So if I call that matrix um, M on the previous slide, then M raised to the power N gives the transition probabilities for all N iterations. Um, we in our work had focused specifically on the question of what happens when N gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what will be important uh, at some point when N is very big are the eigenvalues of the matrix on the previous slide. And because it is an upper diagonal matrix, uh, the eigenvalues are just sitting right there on the diagonal. I can read them right out of that previous uh, slide. And they are you know, the one for that absorbing state where both individuals have died. And then they are their survival probabilities for the three different pair types and the survival probabilities for the loners. And they're right there. And uh, later, it will be important, you know, which one of these is the biggest, for example. Payoffs, again, are always probabilities, survival probabilities, so they're, you know, between zero and one. We'll just not worry about the idea that they could be equal to zero or equal to one for the purposes of this talk. And, of course, this uh, Empty state is the absorbing state and the limit, you know, both individuals are bound to die if you play the game long enough. So here's an example. I don't really need the matrix um, to do calculations on these things. Um, for example, the probability that both individuals survive all in iterations is just the probability that both survive one iteration, A squared, that raised to the nth power, right? And the slightly more complicated things that come out, for example, the probability that um, I start off with one cooperator and one defector, and at the end of the game, uh, there's just one defector. That means that the cooperator must have died somewhere along the way in one of the iterations, i from one up to n. And so the two of them survive up to i minus one iteration, and then the um, the cooperator dies, the defector lives, and then the defector has to survive the remaining iterations. So I can write down these probabilities um, pretty easily and, and get answers for uh, any of the transition probabilities. And uh, we have done this for the general form of the matrix. And, um, and the point is, one that I brought up before, the individual's situation can change drastically. So in this particular example, B uh, trades this nice um, probability of survival it might have had, might have been very big, but when the cooperator dies, it trades it for this other one, D naught. All right. So working through all of that, uh, getting all of those uh, transition probabilities, and then calculating these payoffs, which this would just be the probability that both of the individual A's survive to the end of the game, plus one half of the probability that one of them survives to the end of the game. Because I'm thinking about the, in this calculation, I'm thinking about the payoffs to a particular individual. So if one of them dies, it, half the time it would be me, half the time it would be my partner. All right, so these are the general results for our model that we found, um, and they're written in a certain way. So, so there are the two key differences that I have been um, focusing on in this talk, and you can see the way that they're written is that they have the eigenvalues here, raised to 
the nth powers, and then these other fractions, which are written in a certain way, um, so that if that eigenvalue associated with that fraction is the largest eigenvalue, or you know, more simply is bigger than the other one in the denominator, then the fraction is positive. So the signs of these things, plus, plus, minus, minus, give the contribution of each of those terms to those fitness differences, A minus Cn and B minus Dn. So it's a, just a convenient way of writing it. Um, and then I can plug that into a formula like the replicator equation and see what happens. So we're interested in prolonged survival games. So how can, when n gets bigger and bigger, how can I, can I expect cooperation to become favored in, under any circumstances? And here is how it goes. You know, when, when n is equal to one in a single iteration, I just have those simple differences, a minus cn, a minus c, and b minus d. Uh, for very, very long games, everything becomes neutral because I choose two individuals, they definitely both die regardless of their type if n is big enough and selection won't really, really be working. So I have some selection here and eventually no selection. So I can identify cases like this example here where if the expected change in the frequency of the cooperators is negative when n is one or small, um, but then eventually it uh, approaches that neutral equilibrium you know, from above, from the positive direction, then I can infer that sometime in there, it's just kind of weak criterion for this um, question of when cooperation could be favored. I know that if that happened, I had crossed that zero at some point, right? All right, and here's an example, just a graphical example of it without any analysis, but using a prisoner's dilemma with particular survival probabilities, they're not very big, so I only have an 80% chance of surviving. Uh, if I'm a cooperator with another cooperator and so on, and then pretty low um, individual loner survival probabilities. And this has that same sort of shape as the um, uh, graph I showed you, that model from the Jaeger and Hoyer's model, uh, but it's a little different. It, we have these, uh, you know, peaks and whatnot in the, in the shapes of these curves that don't happen in their model. Uh, but it overall does the same sort of thing where I start off with a prisoner's dilemma and then I go to a stag hunt game and then I go to a harmony game as I iterate uh, the uh, matrix. All right, so the next example is with all of these survival probabilities much, much closer to one and two different versions of a prisoner's dilemma that have different or, uh, relative magnitudes of the payoffs. And so this one is similar to the graph on the previous slide, prisoner dilemma, stag hunt, hawk dove game. And the, just as on the previous slide, these are evenly spaced um, payoffs between 0.94. Yeah, what did I say, hawk dove? Sorry, harmony game. Uh, and what is different from the previous slide is this behavior here where there's some number of iterations where things get worse and worse and worse for the cooperator. And this is uh, by the accumulation of these payoffs, these are pretty close to one, so I don't have that much of a chance of trading my situation for one of this slightly worse situation until a number of iterations have happened. So that, um, that induces this sort of uh, decrease and then increase and then eventually in both cases crossing and becoming this harmony game where cooperation would be favored. Um, the difference between here and here is this is a, just a, a transformation of that original prisoner's dilemma matrix, that axelrod type matrix that I showed early on um, down into this world between zero and one. Um, and so these are not evenly spaced, but they only differ a little bit, right? between these two matrices. And so tweaking the parameters a bit can um, uh, change it from the intermediate state being hawk dove to being stag hunt, which is interesting. There's a lot of behavior in here that it would be interesting to look at. All right, so now I need to move along. Five minutes, you say. Here's an example where I start with a stag hunt game and start with a hawk dove game here and here, and it just shows that you can get the same sort of thing, the details are different, but eventually if I wait long enough, uh, cooperation will uh, become favored, even if I start with these kinds of games. 
so the, all of the examples that I've given so far have the, have the property that A squared is the largest of the non-unit eigenvalues. All of those numerical examples were that way. And when that is true, then in the long run, there was only one term in all of those big equations for these four different payoffs that will be big. The rest are going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and it's going to be this one here. It'll be positive and it's in A n. And so I would end up with a situation like this where A n minus C n is approximately, if I only keep the one that has the biggest eigenvalue, approximately equal to this. And it's greater than zero, I know. Um, because A squared is the biggest eigenvalue, and the Bn minus Dn is uh, close to zero in comparison. And so I could plug all of that into, uh, an, uh, make an approximation for my replicator equation, and it would be positive across the entire range of x, as long as n is really, really big. And then I can go back and look at these equations, the general results that we got, and uh, think about other large n approximations. So the one that I just reviewed was this one here, uh, where a squared is the biggest eigenvalue, so that term becomes the biggest. Uh, we looked at four different possible possibilities. The next one would be that b times c is the biggest eigenvalue. And then I would have this term and this term in the long run. I would have negative a minus c n and positive b n minus d n. And that's the second one. So there I would have a kind of a hocked up game preserved even as n goes to infinity. If a zero is the biggest eigenvalue, then both of these terms will dominate. And so I have positive values for both of those. That sort of makes sense. Uh, if d naught is the biggest, then it's, they're both negative in the long run. It will never be true that d squared is the largest eigenvalue because of the assumption that a is the cooperative type, that little a is bigger than little d. All right, I'm starting to hurry because I just ran out of time rather drastically. Um, if, on the other hand, the game does not enhance survival, so if the loner survival probabilities are bigger than these ones, and in particular bigger than the square of these ones, which they certainly are in this case, then I can get the opposite sort of behavior where I start off with a, a cooperative dilemma of a certain strength and it becomes worse somehow for, not somehow, very clearly how, become, goes from, for example, in this particular numerical example from a hawk dove game to a prisoner's dilemma before it eventually becomes neutral. All right, I'm gonna have to speed through the rest of this a little bit. The topic of finite populations is a rather large one. Um, we have worked out the details of a Moran-type model for this kind of situation. And the, uh, the trouble is that even if I make a prediction about the average change in allele frequency in a finite population, it might be that one or the other type goes to fixation regardless of which one is favored over uh, whatever parts of the frequency range. And so people, what they do, um, and what we have done, but sort of obliquely, is appeal to fixation probabilities or equilibrium frequencies and make comparisons between the invasion of a cooperator into an all-defector population versus a defector into an all-cooperator population. Uh, for the one example I focused on where cooperative types become favored uh, in the long run, it's not really necessary to do that, but you do have to do one thing. Um, and so I really have no time, but here's the Moran model that we looked at. Uh, and the basic idea is that we choose two individuals without replacement, like I just did in that blanket sharing case. We play the game, zero, one, or two of us die. And then in the Moran model, we keep the population size the same by filling those slots with the same number of offspring chosen at random from the population. And this is a really interesting model. It's not the same as a, as a typical Moran model because I'm letting all of the selection happen in the game. I'm not rescaling uh, the probabilities of choosing individuals by the mean fitness or anything. So it has a kind of a nice uh, feature to it that I would like to explore more. But I don't have time to talk about the details of it. There, you can write, it, write down all the stuff. Um, the point of it is, that what I need to do is look at now finite uh, values for the frequencies. So k is now the number of a individuals, and I can derive, we, we derive these equations, this one in particular, for the expected change in k, given that it's k right now, um, 
And there it is. And it looks a lot like the equations for the infinite populations. But now I have these things like that. And so if k happens to be 1, then that term that was very important for the case I was focusing on uh, is no longer there. You know, I can't, the, the reason being that I can't choose two cooperators to play the game when there's only one in the population. And so I just need to look at that one case. And in the particular uh, case that I looked at where it was a prisoner's dilemma, almost all the time that is still expected uh, to be positive. The expectation of delta k is positive and small, and all the other ones are positive and larger. And so even in a finite population, I can get the kinds of results that happen in the infinite population. Didn't do justice to the details of that, but, um, but there it is. I went too slow. All right. I have no time, right? No time. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to just stop um, and say thank you. Um, so here are the two basic ideas. When the game itself really enhances survival, then it can be true that cooperative types become favored when we iterate this kind of game, even if they're very disfavored in a single iteration, in every iteration, whenever there are two players. Uh, of course, when the opposite is true, when the game itself does not enhance survival, you can get the opposite kind of behavior. And uh, we have these general results for any sort of survival game that has the structure that I talked about. OK, sorry for skipping over so much, but thank you for listening. Thank you, John, for that great talk and that maybe gave us some insight into why Etienne might need not die <laughs> when playing the game with you. Uh, questions? Uh, thanks. Um, might be trivial, but if A equals would equal C and B would equal D, um, would this be a kind of chaotic situation? And um, does it also have this probability of turning um, of um, turning to a, um, a harmony game on the long run? If the two of them are equal, um, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, I think the <coughs> that's a very good question. That's a, it's not trivial. I'll just say that much. Yeah. So if they're, if, they're, um, if they're equal to each other, but they're bigger than uh, the loner survival probabilities, then we'll get something potentially like what I described. But I honestly haven't looked at that. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, can you imagine doing this in uh, moving environments, like changing the payoff in time? To see how... Sure. Yeah. Why would I, I mean, yes. I mean, because, yeah, well, you, you might have just a strategy over one environment and then another one would be better. Over yeah, and you could think one thing that we've been talking about a lot but haven't done is whether it would make sense in this game to switch my strategy, mm -hmm. right, at some point in the game. You can think that maybe if I knew we were only going to be out for 100 nights, I might seal the blanket on night 99. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be some time back in the game when it would no longer make sense to change strategy, but yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's thank John. <laughs> <laughs>